normally I get a, uh, a welcome which just says, here's Martin Bromley. So thank you very much for that, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so you've, you've kind of heard the story already, I guess, and I, I'm just going to add a little bit to it and just talk a little bit more about some observations uh, around, around safety. The, um, my, uh, my, my background, as being mentioned, is a, an airline pilot. Uh, this is a very old picture, but I still choose to use it because I have hair on it. Uh, and I'm very proud of that, and the kids don't believe I ever had hair. Um, so this is uh, 17 years ago or so, and uh, I'm now a captain for a major UK airline. I still fly uh, for about 50% of my life, and the other 50% of my life is spent uh, doing this sort of thing. Um, perhaps uh, appropriate to, to talk of a story of error to begin with, uh, this picture reminds me, it looks very complex in the flight deck, and, and there's a true story that happened at Heathrow many years ago of an American pilot who was on the ground and he was doing his welcome on board uh, address to the passengers over the PA system. And uh, unfortunately, he'd pressed the wrong switch. And instead of uh, transmitting to the passengers, he actually transmitted it over the air traffic control frequency. And, uh, and about halfway through, he realized his error. He stopped transmitting and he figured that the best thing to do was to fess up straight away. So he just pressed the transmit button again and said, uh, gee guys, I'm sorry, there's so many switches and buttons in this cockpit. Uh, quick as a flash, a British voice comes back and said, yes, but there's only one knob. <laughs> um, however, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, uh, an error and a series of errors that, of course, were just that little bit more serious. So you've already seen the picture today. This is Elaine with our two young children, Victoria and Adam. And, and the important thing to remember here is that Elaine had good health. Uh, but she'd had some sinus problems. She goes in for a procedure on the 29th of March 2005. She was anaesthetized, problems occurred, and in the end she was transferred to intensive care unconscious. She never regained consciousness and she died 13 days later. I, as you can imagine, was overwhelmed. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to start. Um, and, and my focus was on Victoria and Adam to begin with. And obviously making sure that Elaine got better, which never happened, as we now know. But I remember having made that decision after about five days that we were going to switch off Elaine's life support chatting to the head of the intensive care unit and just saying, you know, I hope there's some lessons that can be learnt when this is investigated. And, and you know, not, not to blame anybody, but just so we can hopefully understand or learn something from what had happened. Because what I knew at this point was that they'd done all the right things, but it just didn't work out. Um, and, you know, that happens, that's life. And, and he said to me, we won't investigate, not unless you sue or complain. And he wasn't being blunt, he wasn't being horrible. He was just kind of telling me how things were then. But I think for me that was the defining moment. Th there was a, 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 an independent review in the end, and uh, I, I, you know, the story is, is now available online, it's available, the, the report in an anonymized version is available. Um, but essentially Elaine was being cared for by an experienced uh, team. And they, found that things overtook them, that the uh, emergency developed slowly, it became a can't intubate, can't ventilate, that the, the original plan of how they were going to anaesthetize the lane was, was probably sound, um, and that they started to do the right things uh, to try and intubate her, but in doing that they became fixated. The, there ended up being three doctors around Elaine who were attempting to intubate because it was the only solution they could think of. When in fact this had developed as a can't intubate, can't ventilate, and teaching would suggest there would be an alternative route such as surgical access. The, the three doctors didn't have a shared picture of what was happening, what we termed situational awareness was different amongst the three doctors of what was happening, what it meant and what needed to happen. 
as I say, under stress, the decision-making became fixated, which is perfectly normal, we know that, and, and the communication amongst them dried up. What was, what was difficult, though, I think, for me, was that when we had this independent review, discovering that not only did those things happen, but that the team around them, two nurses and two ODPs, operating department practitioners or anaesthetic nurses, could see what was happening and tried to speak up, but was simply unable to get the message across. So in this very complex case, which as I say is available online, we have, we have situations, uh, we have an issue here of a, a loss of situational awareness, we have uh, problems with decision making, at the inquest there was a dispute about who was in charge at different points, so the leadership was confused. Uh, the, the, the story with the other staff, the if you like more junior staff though, was different because they had that situational awareness They'd, they'd got the tracheostomy kit available. Um, a, a nurse had already phoned intensive care and had announced it to the, the doctors that she'd done that. But even at that moment, they'd looked at her as if to say, what's wrong? You're overreacting. The hints and tips weren't enough. And, and the hierarchy, frankly, was too challenging for the, quote, junior members in the team who were actually the ones who could see what was happening. So these failings in all these kind of things I've talked about in these non-technical skills or what we often talk about as human factors um, uh, were the sorts of things that as a pilot I was familiar with. And we know that 75% of aviation accidents are caused by these things. And so to me back in 2005 looking at this, I was astounded as I started to find out what was done about this in healthcare and the answer was well, not much at all actually. As you can imagine I've reflected long and hard over the years uh, about what happened and I'll just take you through some perspectives. I've talked about these sorts of things about you know issues around you know team working and personal stress and their cognitive capacity and, and we can focus on those things and what it does is it drives uh, a, a focus on the team, on the individuals involved. They must have been bad people. We can't help ourselves. Anaesthetists actually, and I know there's some anaesthetists in the room, are the worst at this because they look at this and they say, I wouldn't have done that. But you know what? In the Scottish Clinical Simulation Centre in Stirling, they put teams through a similar scenario. It's a, a, with a mannequin, it's a knife attack victim. They don't know it's similar. But when they get involved, they often end up following a very similar painful path. And actually, when people have never been in a situation, they don't know what it's going to be like for real. And, and some good things have happened since then. I've been working and campaigning now for a number of years, but I must mention at this moment that there are some people in this room here who have been on this route a lot longer than I have. Liam Donaldson kicked a lot of this work off in the UK 18 years ago now with an organisation with a memory. And, and we have people in the room such as Josephine O'Clue, who's been at this far longer than I have. And so I could, but I can only take us back to 2005 because that's when I got involved. But, you know, now we start to understand safety. We start to use cognitive aids, although I think sometimes we think checklists are much better than they really are. Uh, we use simulation a lot more, we're talking about team resource management, we, we talk about these non-technical skills, we do some very specific care bundles, but, but, but these are all very focused on the immediate front line. When we look at a definition of human factors and ergonomics, actually it's a lot more than that. We see words on here around tasks and equipment and workspace and culture and organisation. And actually, simplistically, it's about these things. 
It's about making it easy to do the right things for our front line. And conversely, making it hard to do the wrong things. So this diagram actually is incomplete because there's all these things. And I would argue in Elaine's case that these were not bad people. These were very good people who were doing their very best for Elaine, but they didn't have the benefit of the systems and the training and the processes and the protocols which other industries have. Some of the audience might recognise these two characters, Ayrton Senna, the racing driver who died in a Formula One crash about 25 years ago, and Professor Sid Watkins, who at the time was the Chief Medical Officer of Formula One. I was very lucky to spend an evening with Sid many years ago. He has sadly now passed away, but we spent the evening talking about Senna and the impact it had on him. Up until the point of Senna's death, 20, in the 25 years previous, about one driver a year died in a Formula One accident. In the 25 years after Senna's death, I believe only one driver has died as a result of a racing accident. That is a remarkable improvement in safety. When Senna died, what Sid Watkins didn't do was he didn't go to the racing drivers and say, hey guys, slow down, take it easy, don't take any risks. What he did was he campaigned for subtle changes to the rules. He campaigned for subtle changes to the track design. He campaigned with the manufacturers to, to make safety now a feature of their vehicles. He standardized medical facilities at Formula One tracks. That remarkable improvement in safety is a valuable lesson in system safety, not from a pilot, but from a doctor. And you know, we, we, this is a model we love in aviation. This is some work from NASA, from Bob Heimrich. Uh, and, you know, uh, at the front line, we often spend our time mitigating the consequences of error, but that's the wrong place. What we want to be doing is trapping error, or even better, we want to be avoiding the error-prone situation in the first case. Yet, as has already been mentioned today, I believe, around medication safety, as an example, we go off and we buy drugs that do different things, but we make sure they're in packaging that's very similar. And then we give it to the front line and we say, hey guys, here's an error prone situation. Be careful. Don't make a mistake. Double check. You might get in trouble. We present in healthcare all the time error prone situations and expect the front line to deal with it. And, you know, I just use drugs as an example, and, and I really welcome the focus that we've had today from Jeremy Hunt on medication safety and medication errors. That's really, really important. But we see it in all sorts of equipment around healthcare. Uh, this is a, a genuine example, by the way, uh, from, uh, from healthcare. Um, it's a kind of an obvious one, though, isn't it? It's where a system has been developed that is error prone. But let me tell you another story which isn't so obvious. About three years ago on the south of England, a fairly healthy male presented an accident and emergency and he'd had a fit and they didn't know why. Anyway, they did some tests and they basically said, okay, we're going to fix up an appointment for you to see a neurologist and we're going to fix up for you to have a scan, so we're going to send you home, here's some paperwork, we'll be in touch. It took nine months for him to sit in front of a neurologist with that scan and at the end of that nine months, it was discovered he had an inoperable brain tumour. And when a group of human factors experts worked with the hospital to look at what happened, what they found is from that decision to give him that scan to see a neurologist, it took 20 separate steps of bookings in computer systems, of phone calls, of bits of paper passing around to actually get to that meeting. And of course, that's 20 opportunities to make a mistake. What they did at that hospital is they redesigned the system so it now only takes three steps. It doesn't guarantee this won't happen again, but it's a darn sight more efficient, it's cheaper, and it will probably 
give a much greater likelihood of preventing that. So these, these processes and systems aren't always as obvious as this. Um, the challenge, of course, in system safety is that healthcare is complex. Here's a quick diagram that I took off the internet. Uh, that's the uh, UK healthcare system. You've got it? Great, thanks. Um, actually, uh, just take a quick look again if you struggled that last time. Uh, actually, it's really complex, isn't it? The thing is, healthcare systems everywhere are complex. It doesn't matter what part of the world you are in, they are all complex. It's the nature of the beast. And this is a very brave attempt by an organisation to put, uh, put it on one slide, but there's still lots missing. But the important thing here, you don't need to see the detail, is that if we're to develop system safety, where we start to streamline processes and protocols and purchasing and procurement and all that sort of stuff, we have to be able to influence all these bodies, whoever they are. And that's a really big job. Uh, fairly recently, uh, Secretary of State for Health has talked about the idea that actually instead of financing healthcare for five years, we should finance it for longer. And one of the advantages that something like that might bring us is that when we start to look longer term, we can start to make some longer term plans. And one of the things I would really welcome, I think, in healthcare everywhere is longer term coordinated safety plans where we can talk generally about the big potential errors, the big potential threats, and some form of coordinated planning of small parts so that all parts of the businesses can start to think about what is it we we can do to make a small difference here that makes a big difference when put together at the front line. We need all parts of the system to do those small little things that will make the bigger difference. And that's a big job. But with some longer term planning, the possibility of doing that might be there. And the second thing I think is absolutely essential in whatever system you're in, and, and I'm talking about all systems around the world, we need to bring in this kind of human factors expertise to all those organisations, whoever they are, those national bodies, those royal colleges, whatever, so we can start to think in a more systems way. Because the goal of this is to make it easy at the front line, to make it easy to do the right things. Just a thought on that, by the way, this is a nice diagram from a guy called René Alberti, who does a lot of work in France. He worked with aviation for many years. He's now working with healthcare. He's worked as well in this country with Charles Vincent, and they've done some great work on safer healthcare. They produced a book, which is available for free, by the way. You don't see that very often in healthcare. And, and if you'll excuse me using UK driving limits here, um, what they they kind of, the, the model works like this. So, so, you know, if you go out on the UK roads, you will drive at the speed limit of 70 miles an hour. And I know you will, because I can see you're all very safe people out there. None of you would break the speed limit. But you know what? You're driving along and you're a bit late and the people around you are going a little bit faster and it's okay, isn't it? Isn't that all right just to go a bit faster than the speed limit? Maybe 80 would be okay. And then we get really late and we push it harder and we suddenly find ourselves, we have deviated and we have ended up in a really dangerous place. My observation is that in aviation and nuclear and rail, and this is fairly true around the world by the way, we tend to operate in this green zone. We tend to operate at that 70 miles an hour because the rules that are written for us make it easy to get it right and hard to get it wrong. And, and that's recognised. The problem we have in healthcare for years is that people have got used to working in that 90 mile an hour zone all the time. And they kind of do it not because they're bad people, but they do it just to get the job done, despite the systems, the complex systems that are around them. And our challenge over the coming 10, 20 years is to design systems that make it not only easy to do the right things, but easy to do within the rules that we have. And that's a really big long-term challenge for all healthcare systems. And once we get to that point, it will be so much easier for the people at the front line. And a final thought. 
We've already had mention of the Dr. Bara Garba case. Let's talk about just culture. Because I think for me, it, having a just culture is fundamental. It's something we strive for in other safety critical industries. I, I am going to be, and, and this is absolutely from the heart when I say this, we have had, in many respects, the best five years we have had in healthcare because despite the challenges, despite the difficult times that we have, actually we have a Secretary of State for Health who is prepared to stand up and recognise the importance of learning to make a difference and has been prepared to stick his neck out and keep coming again to safety and again to learning and again to safety and again to learning. And that, that fixation is a really good fixation because it's allowed us to start talking about, hang on a minute, is the culture right in healthcare? And the answer we know is it's not. And we're now able, I think, to start recognising in, in the reaction to the Dr. Bara Garba case, whatever the rights and wrongs of the actual case, and I don't want to get into that, actually now people are saying, hang on a minute, this isn't right. Whereas in ten, five, ten years ago, people would have just gone, yeah, well, that's the way it is sometimes. And, and, and we really don't have a just culture in many respects. We need to have a situation where inadvertent human error is not found grossly negligent, but where people are supported and coached and understand that's how the system is. We mustn't tolerate genuinely, appropriately apportioned gross negligence, and we mustn't tolerate deliberate acts. And a just culture recognises that, and working towards a just culture is the next challenge I think we have in healthcare. But it must be just for the clinicians, it must be just for the taxpayer, and it must be just for those most harmed. And, and within that, we have to listen to all the people who are most affected. And sometimes those people might be difficult to listen to. Sometimes they might be people who are very poor advocates of their own position. Sometimes they might be the most disadvantaged, the most discriminated. They might be having mental health issues and may find it very difficult to express their concerns or issues. And sometimes within the healthcare system itself, we may find that there are groups of people who are discriminated against or groups of people who are assumed to be less important than others. And what's interesting is in all the flurry about the GMC's verdict around Dr. Baragaba, we kind of forget about the nursing side as well. I'm happy in the last few minutes to take any questions. Thank you very much for your time. And just a thank you to everybody here who is working towards making healthcare safer. Thank you.